What do we really know about our own past? Buildings as impressive as they are enigmatic, such as the Kalisa Temple, raise a profound question by their very existence. How much does what is written in our history books ultimately coincide with historical reality? Did the ancients really have only the primitive tools and techniques at their disposal that we generally attribute to them? Or do the ancient threads ultimately come together to form a revolutionary truth that most historians find simply impossible? Some things are literally carved in stone, and others literally, according to this, the magnificent Kalisa Temple, was by no means painstakingly piled up into a coherent structure, but hewn directly out of a natural rock outcrop. Located in India, in the state of Maharashtra, the Hindu sanctuary leaves us absolutely speechless with its colossal power and detailed workmanship. The fact that the building is unofficially referred to as the eighth wonder of the world is no coincidence. The creation of the complex, which is around 90 meters long and 60 meters wide, required a level of knowledge and skill that can be described as demanding, to say the least. As mentioned, the architectural masterpiece was completely carved out of the natural rock, but that is by no means all. In detail, this task was also mastered by driving at an angle and from the top down. It is estimated that between 150,000 and 400,000 tons of stone had to be removed. But when was this actually done, and what was the motivation behind this mammoth project? Well, fortunately, those looking for historical clues can refer to a contemporary building inscription. It mentions the name of Rashtrakuta King Krishna I and the year 765. And yet, this is where it gets a little tricky. According to the experts, it would normally have taken several decades to complete a temple of this kind. In fact, the Kalisa Temple is said to have been built in around 18 years, and that, mind you, only with the use of simple hammers and chisels. While there are still some question marks surrounding the circumstances of its construction, there is no doubt as to its purpose. Some inscriptions indicate that the Kalisa Temple was dedicated to the Hindu deity Shiva, whose abode is believed to be the eponymous Mount Kailash in the Himalayas. And given this religious context, it is not surprising that the Kalisa Temple is also accompanied by a mystical story. According to legend, a powerful king once fell seriously ill. The desperate queen then turned to Shiva and promised to have a magnificent temple built in his honor if her husband was cured of his illness. She also vowed to fast until she could see the top of the temple. However, after the queen's prayers had been answered, the builders brought sobering news it would take years to complete the temple. Soon afterwards, however, another builder appeared who claimed to be able to build a temple whose top would be visible within a week, which is why he began to carve the sanctuary into the rock from the top to bottom. Proof of a lost technology? While such accompanying myths sound exciting, they do not offer conservative researchers any solid evidence to uncover the real construction background. Basically, we should bear in mind that the Kalisa Temple is by no means unique in all respects, and that it is in the best of company. In detail, the Pompous Sanctuary is part of the so-called Elora Caves, which include 34 Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain cave temples, and have been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1983. In fact, most of the other temples in Elora were also carved directly into the stone. However, the Kalisa Temple differs from the other buildings in that it was designed as a freestanding structure. However, it was only after the hundreds of thousands of tons of stone had been removed that the work entered its hot, or rather filigree, phase. The ceiling of the vestibule is adorned with a breathtaking lotus adornment, which also shows four lions pointing in all directions. The entrance hall in turn houses the goddesses Ganga and Yumana, who were generally regarded as guardian figures, in the same breath, the entrance area is also adorned with other deities such as Ganesh and Lakshmi, and a series of mythical sages. If you proceed to the upper area of the temple itself, you will also see a Nandi bull, which according to Hindu mythology, was Shiva's mount. No less impressive is the so-called Shiva Lingam, the non-pictorial symbol of Shiva, which is located in the sanctum, the innermost sanctuary of the temple. 
However, this may only be entered by the Brahmins, the members of the highest caste, who mainly make up the Hindu priests. The inner courtyard is equally astonishing. It is dominated by two mighty elephants, which stand for strength, power, and dignity. The same applies to the 16-meter-high monoliths, which also represent a remnant of the original rock. All in all, the appearance of the Kailasa Temple is likely to leave most viewers open-mouthed, and yet there are those who are puzzled by this architectural wonder. For some, the idea that the stone splendor was created solely through the use of simple hand tools seems unimaginable. But what does that mean in reverse? Well, quite simply, the creators of the Kailasa Temple possessed highly developed technologies that we wouldn't even dare to dream of nowadays. A fact that should not only apply to the temple complex in question, but to all monumental buildings of antiquity. Do the buildings of the past reveal an unbelievable truth? But how is this possible? How did all the peoples of antiquity manage to produce technological marvels independently of one another? Well, the answer from the alternative camp is, it's not. Because the Egyptian pyramids, the colossal structures in South and Central America, and the Kalesa Temple in India would actually have a direct connection. The stone giants are all based on a higher knowledge that the different cultures did not acquire themselves, but that was revealed to them. It is no coincidence that we find so many ancient buildings in different corners of the world that resemble each other so closely. But even apart from the astonishing architectural parallels, there is one fact that leads us to a historical truth that seems unimaginable to most mainstream historians. The treacherous myths and legends of our ancestors. Almost every ancient culture knew the story of a devastating flood that swallowed everything. For example, the Batak in Indonesia told the legend of the creator god Debata, who conjured up a severe deluge to cleanse the earth. At the top of the highest mountain, only a human couple managed to escape destruction. Of course, we also know such a story from the Bible. However, the experiences of Noah, which are described in the Old Testament, show astonishing similarities to the significantly older Gilgamesh epic. Indian folklore, on the other hand, knows of a fisherman named Manu who survived a catastrophic flood after a divine warning. And basically, regardless of whether we immerse ourselves in the ranks of the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Chinese, or the ancient Greeks, we are confronted with different accounts of one and the same event. But that is by no means all. The flood stories by no means end in absolute annihilation, but with the arrival of higher beings who emerge from the darkness and reveal advanced knowledge to the locals. For example, the god Quetzalcoatl taught the indigenous inhabitants of Mexico how to farm and raise livestock, and also instructed them in astronomy, architecture, and art. And isn't it amazing that we also find similar reports in countless other cultures that had no connection with ancient Mexico? Thus, civilization is described again and again as a gift, and by no means as something that grew out of itself. The scenario is always the same. There is a severe flood that plunges the world into unholy chaos, and then a figure emerges from the shadows who knows what it takes to turn a simple ethnic group into an advanced civilization. In Greek mythology, the role is played by the Titan Prometheus. The Indian cultures that preceded the Incas knew of a bearded creature called Weracucha, who emerged from a gigantic lake and taught the locals how to carve stone. Even in the Pacific, legends circulate about a creature called Maui, who created the islands and taught the natives how to use tools. So the question is, doesn't a myth that is known in practically every corner of the world eventually turn into a real memory? Alternative researchers such as Graham Hancock answer this question with a resounding yes. According to them, a highly developed, high-tech culture existed long before our time, which was wiped out by a global flood at the end of the last ice age. The few survivors then went out into the world to pave the way to civilization for the simpler peoples. In reality, however, this is not just a, well, daring view of the past, but an indisputable fact that is concealed at all costs. No wonder, after all, the exotic technologies that our lost ancestors are said to have possessed would cause our worldview to collapse like a house of cards. But anyone who still believes that sites such as the Kalesa Temple were built with the help of hammers and chisels is mistaken. 
Instead, it is believed that the ancient workers used technologies based on implosions and vibrational frequencies, which have now even been rediscovered. However, those researchers who have become aware of the technological knowledge of bygone days are afraid of being discredited and excluded from the scientific community because of their controversial work. As a result, they prefer to carry out their experiments in secret laboratories far away from the public eye. In the south of Peru, around 60 kilometers from the city of Cusco, lies a time-honored site of inestimable value to the international research world. After all, Olin Titambo is the only remaining example of urban planning from the Inca period. In other words, the unmistakable buildings and terraces that the legendary indigenous culture built hundreds of years ago are still in their original state today. And although the Incas were ultimately defeated here by the conquistadors, Olin Titambo remains a stone symbol of the resistance of the locals against the Spanish conquerors. Situated more than 2,800 meters above sea level, on the right bank of the Rio Aramumba, the site looks back on a history whose roots go back much further than those of the Incas. While the world-famous advanced civilization ruled over more than 200 peoples and around 9 million people between the 13th and 16th centuries, archaeological finds indicate that the first inhabitants settled in the Sacred Valley of Olotetambo as early as the 9th century. The members of the Kilki culture, in particular, are said to have had a significant influence on the Incas. Settled in the area around present-day Cusco from around 900 to 1200 AD, the Kilki were known for their agricultural skills, pottery production, and the construction of imposing megalithic structures. Megalithic structures that the Incas later used as the basis for their own magnificent buildings. The situation was very similar in the case of agricultural infrastructure. The Kilki built the first terraces and irrigation systems, laying the foundation stone of supply that was to be adapted and expanded by the Incas. Ultimately, however, the fertility of the land was not the only factor that made Alitetambo an excellent location. The strategically favorable location in the middle of important trade routes also transformed the site into an important settlement long before the arrival of the Incas. After the collapse of the Wari Empire, however, a power vacuum arose in the region, which led to the short-term emergence of numerous regional groups, all of which competed for supremacy. One of these groups was the Kingdom of Cusco, which would later become known as the Inca Empire. As it grew in importance and expanded, it eventually absorbed the Kilki and the other local cultures that had preceded it. In the same breath, the knowledge and the achievements of the predecessor cultures were integrated into the much larger Inca state. And ultimately, it was this fusion of established ingenuity and the ambition of the new rulers that set in motion the transformation of Ali Tambo into an important political, military, and religious center. The Wall of Six Monoliths presents us with major problems. While the upswing of the empire began as early as the 13th century, the transformation of Ali Tambo only took off under the reign of Pachatukek Yapakunaki. The ninth rule of the Inca Empire was in power from 1438 to 1471, and in retrospect, he is best known for the destruction of the Chanka forces, the expansion of the infrastructure, and the extension of the empire from Lake Titicaca to the Andean region of Junian. As a result, Ali Tintambo was also significantly altered and transformed into both a ceremonial center and a military fortress. The Incas expanded the original complex and built extensive terraces, which not only maximized the cultivation areas, but also counteracted soil erosion and ensured an efficient water supply. The so-called Endines also had another function. The Incas used the terraces as an integrated defensive bulwark that was difficult to overcome making the entire settlement a fortress at the same time. To realize that the Incas were true masters of urban planning, just take a quick look at the amazingly sophisticated irrigation system. This consists of baths, aqueducts, and artificial canals, and amazingly, it is still largely intact today. In detail, the cool water from the surrounding streams and rivers was channeled and transported into the so-called conchas, these are a total of 15 square blocks made up of straight and narrow streets, each with an entrance to the central courtyard, which is lined with houses. 
By far the most impressive building in Alitetambo, however, is the so-called Temple of the Sun. At the same time, the monumental core also embodies the site's most enigmatic structure. It is suspected not to have been built by the Incas at all, but by the early Tiwanaku culture. The bottom line is that the Temple of the Sun now only exists in the form of remains, but these remains are quite something. On the one hand, there are the sheer dimensions. The Wall of the Six Monoliths, for example, consists of stone blocks that weigh around 50 tons each. This makes it all the more remarkable that the stone giants did not come from the Temple Mount itself, but from a quarry on the opposite side of the valley. In other words, the builders had to transport the massive loads down a mountain, across a river, across the plains of the Sacred Valley, and then up another mountain. But regardless of whether it was the Incas or the members of the Tiwanaku culture, whoever mastered this mammoth task has also left us with a historical mystery. In fact, we do not know which tools and techniques were used for this undertaking. What we do know, however, is that the monoliths are earthquake-proof. Yes, you heard that right. The blocks interlock so perfectly that they move with the ground when shaken, instead of toppling over. Well, this doesn't apply to all blocks. Some of the stones that once crowned the Temple of the Sun now lie in front of the wall of the six monoliths. Ultimately, however, it is not just the sheer force of these silent witnesses to history that makes them an archaeological mystery. The ruins are also adorned with strange knobs, which are commonly interpreted as intuatanas or sundials. A perfectly plausible interpretation, but with a small but crucial catch. We have no idea how exactly such sundials would have worked. Of Aliens and Gods the theory that we are actually dealing with a relic from the Tiwanaku culture is based on the one hand of the stepped motif carved into the fourth monolith, and on the other hand, on the T-shaped sockets that adorn several blocks and are also considered a trademark of Tiwanaku culture. It is certain that the Tiwanaku culture existed from around 1000 BC to 1000 AD and formed southeast of Lake Titicaca. In view of this, one hypothesis is that the Tawanaku elements were brought to Oli Tatambu by stonemasons from the same region. At the same time, however, this hypothesis of adaption also raises a fundamental question. Why would stonemasons from the Lake Titicaca region remember something from the Tawanaku culture if nothing comparable had been built for several centuries? However, there is another approach that can be used to explain the monumental architecture of Oli Tetambo although this requires a certain amount of imagination. Some alternative researchers believe that the ancient site is evidence of direct contact between ancient peoples and extraterrestrial intelligences. No wonder, after all, there is an ancient legend that is supposedly to testify to exactly this. According to this story, it was the god Viracocha who guided the Incas in the construction of the city. This highest of all Inca deities is said to have possessed a human form and is considered the creator of civilization in mythology. But what do mythical deities have to do with extraterrestrial life forms? Well, quite simply, in the parascientific field of pre-astronautics, these two things are equated. According to the controversial hypothesis, our ancestors were regularly visited by highly evolved aliens. However, as the inhabitants of Earth simply could not explain their futuristic technologies of their exotic guests, they were quickly worshipped as supernatural deities. In return, the aliens revealed some key technologies to the humans, which made the creation of the monumental buildings and the rise of civilization possible in the first place. An alternative but no less controversial version states that the supposed alien gods are in fact the survivors of a lost advanced civilization an advanced civilization that was wiped out by a worldwide flood catastrophe at the end of the last ice age. The survivors of this mystical, high-tech people then went out into the world to serve as teachers for the simpler peoples. Does the mythical gate of the gods lead to historical truth? And then there is the legend that surrounds Coricancha, the most important temple in the Inca capital of Cusco. One of the largest sanctuaries in the entire Inca Empire, Cori Canacha, was not to survive the destruction of the Spanish conquerors. However, life-size golden statues of deities and deified ancestors used to stand here. But among all the sacred artifacts, one was particularly revered, 
a sun disk made of pure gold. And for good reason. According to legend, this disk was much more than just an ornamental or ritual object. It was the key to a sacred gateway called the Gate of the Gods. It is said the first Inca priest king, Aramu Muru, brought the golden disk to a spiritual place from which people could communicate personally with the gods. A rather strange idea at first, but one that was much more widespread than you might think. After all, the biblical Noah was commissioned to build an ark by none other than God. And in Sumerian, Akkadian, and more than 500 other traditions, there are very similar accounts of a massive flood and divine beings coming to the aid of a select group. According to Inca tradition, Arumu Muru made his way to the sacred site, which is said to have been near Lake Titicaca. He approached a huge gate carved in an artificially flattened mountainside. In the middle of this stone indentation was a depression in which the priest king placed the sun disk. As he did so, the gate gleamed brightly and Aramu walked through and was never seen again. In principle, this story would probably have been dismissed as a pure fairy tale if it were not for the following two circumstances. The local population continues to pass this fantastic account off as a historical event and the gate described actually exists near Lake Titicaca. And an ancient site in Turkey, which has always been overshadowed by huge question marks, proves that the ancient penchant for a megalomania did not begin with the era of the ancient Egyptians. Located in southeastern Anatolia, the roots of Gobekli Tepe go back at least 11,600 years, and massive tea pillars weighing between 8 and 10 tons lie dormant here. It is in the nature of things that the processing and placement of these massive loads required a high degree of knowledge and coordination, and yet a look beyond the archaeological horizon shows that it was always possible to go even bigger. Accordingly, significantly more imposing structures were built in the following millennia, almost transforming the structures of Gobekli Tepe into puny Lego bricks. The Greeks, the Romans, the Maya, and the Incans have left us silent witnesses to time that still take our breath away today. But when it comes to the mystery of ancient gigantic structures, the ancient Egyptians are probably the prime example par excellence. And that doesn't just mean the famous pyramids of Giza. No, the statues, temples, and obelisks also leave many modern researchers largely baffled. A perplexity that is primarily due to the fact that the inhabitants of the Pharaonic Empire did not keep comprehensive records of their building techniques which seems all the more puzzling when we remember that they otherwise recorded practically everything for posterity. In the absence of solid archaeological evidence, experts have no choice but to delve into the field of theories. So how could the Egyptians have moved their blocks of stone weighing tons, and how did they pile them up to create architectural masterpieces? Well, the conventional wisdom among researchers is that the fathers of the pyramids used boats to move the extreme loads from A to B. When it comes to transportation on land, they are said to have used large wooden sledges that were moved with the help of hundreds or even thousands of workers. At the actual ancient construction site, sophisticated ramp systems were then used, which allowed the individual components to be maneuvered upwards and assembled with unparalleled precision to form a monumental structure. In theory, these explanations sound quite conclusive. But in practice, most of the ancient Egyptian construction methods and tools disappeared into the oblivion of the past. But we should not forget one thing. Roman colossal buildings by no means needed to hide from their ancient Egyptian counterparts. In fact, the Romans used some of the largest known blocks of stone in their sites and added a number of tantalizing entries to the list of archaeological mysteries. How did the Romans plan to move this 1,000-ton object? You have to think about it. Made in the quarry of Baalbek in present-day Lebanon, the so-called Stone of the Pregnant Woman is more than 20 meters long, around 5 meters wide, over 4 meters high, and weighs in, at the bottom line, the equivalent of almost 170 African elephants. In view of these extreme dimensions, the following is all the more astonishing. The two other monoliths found at the same site are even more massive. In detail, the weight of the nameless stones is put at 1,240 and 1,650 tons, respectively. 
and they embody no less than some of the largest man-made stones of all time. But why, and above all, how did the Romans want to transport these monsters from the quarry? And what ancient building project required such gigantic blocks? Well, when it comes to the question of the intended use, the experts are unanimous. The conventional wisdom is that the stone colossi were intended for the temple complex at Baalbek. No wonder, since the complex is known for its awe-inspiring giganticism anyway. It is home to some of the largest Roman buildings in the Middle East. Just take a look at the almost ridiculously large stones that form the foundations of the Temple of Jupiter. In the corresponding photos, the people in the foreground almost look like tiny ants. It is obvious that the Romans were able to move loads of this size, but experts can only speculate about the transportation of the megaliths mentioned above. And this despite the fact that there is actually a historical source that provides a deep insight into the secrets of Roman architecture. The Roman military technician and engineer, Marcus Vitruvius, bequeathed the collective work De Architura Libri Decim to posterity. As the only surviving work of architectural theory from antiquity, the Ten Books on Architecture, reveal the background to temples, houses, and cities. At the same time, we also know of several contemporary depictions that show how the Romans used constructions made of winches, hoists, and cranes to realize their ambitious building projects. In the case of particularly large blocks, the theory goes, they may have used several cranes at the same time. In terms of transportation, however, historians point to rollers or sledges. But wouldn't these have instantly broke under the sheer weight of the pregnant woman's stone or sunk into the sandy ground? Well, that's not far-fetched. Despite this, the experts emphasize that even hundreds of years ago, it was perfectly possible to transport extremely large stones over long distances without the use of lost technologies or extraterrestrial aids, mind you. The obelisk in St. Peter's Square, which was moved to its new location in 1586 with the help of 900 workers, 150 horses, and 47 winches, is often cited in this regard. However, it should perhaps be noted at this point that the rose granite monolith only weighs 320 tons and is therefore almost 700 tons lighter than the stone of the pregnant woman. Well, perhaps this is precisely the reason why the stone colossi still lie dormant in the Baalbek quarry and do not adorn an overwhelming monumental temple. The Romans had to admit to themselves that they had overreached themselves and left unfinished business. Do the buildings of antiquity bear witness to an unbelievable truth? Now there is a, well, slightly more alternative camp that is not quite so easily fobbed off with this answer. The idea that the Romans dramatically misjudged their building project simply doesn't seem plausible. The idea that our ancient ancestors were regularly visited by aliens would be a little more plausible. Where the theories of ramps and sheer muscle power have had their day, extraterrestrial beings come into play, who were worshipped as supernatural deities by the inhabitants of Earth. In return, the exotic visitors revealed advanced technologies to humans, which made the creation of the monumental buildings possible in the first place. But what kind of technologies were these? Well, even in the alternative scene, this is not clear. But the bottom line is that the consensus is that they functioned very differently from our modern machines. There is sometimes talk of implosions and the power of sound. For example, the tradition that the Egyptian priests sang while building the pyramids is interpreted to mean that the blocks, which weighed tons, were moved with the help of acoustics. But how much truth is there in these unusual theories? Couldn't the gigantic loads have been moved and worked in a way that doesn't shatter our conventional view of history? Well, to get to the bottom of this question, a research team decided without further ado to put the matter to a practical test. A few years ago in Massachusetts, the participants set themselves the task of lifting a granite obelisk that the sculptor, Rick Brown, had made especially for this purpose. In detail, the researchers used a construction made of a ramp and sand, and while the sand was gradually removed, the obelisk slowly lowered into its intended position. And lo and behold, this simple yet clever method proved to be extremely effective. In the end, the men and women also managed to overcome the final inclination of 15 degrees using pure muscle power, 
and to raise the obelisk completely. However, another modern experiment shows that the Romans and Egyptians at least needed a lot of patience to maneuver their oversized components from A to B. In 2012, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art produced an installation that goes by the name of Levitated Mass. While the free-floating mass weighs a considerable 340 tons, the first task was to bring the 6.55 meter high boulder from the Jarupur Valley Quarry 170 kilometers away to LA. And to accomplish this, a specifically designed truck had to be built around the stone monster. And here's the thing, the vehicle was 80 meters long, 9.75 meters wide, and had 196 wheels. During transportation, the XXL truck crept along the road at 6 kilometers an hour. In total, the transfer took 11 night drives and $10 million. The press described the operation as the largest of its kind since the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. In Sri Lanka, situated on the dizzying peak of a huge rock, the mystical site not only opens a vivid window into the past, but also poses a number of tantalizing puzzles for modern researchers. After all, how did people manage to create such an architectural marvel more than 1,500 years ago? And can it really be that forces were at work here that were literally not of this world? As just mentioned, the Sagiria Rock Fortress can look back on over 1,500 years of history. And yet, this is only half the historical truth. Archaeological discoveries have revealed that human settlement in the region did not begin with the construction of the fortress, but 3,500 years earlier. In the course of time, in the 3rd century BC to be precise, some Buddhist monks also settled in the surrounding area. But to understand what the time-honored ruins, which were declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site 1982, are all about, we have to turn the wheel of time forward another two centuries. Because although the monolith, around 200 meters high, is not what we would describe as an easily accessible place at first glance, it does have one decisive advantage. It is difficult for enemies to reach, and it provides a perfect panoramic view of the surrounding landscape. But first things first, in 473 AD, King Dahasunena of Anurapaura had been in power for almost 20 years. Dahasunena's rightful heir to the throne was his son, Mogalana, although the ruler had another descendant. However, as Kasapa had been fathered by one of the king's concubines, he had to take second place in the line of succession. But as we all know, human greed for power is sometimes greater than the love of one's own family. And so it came to pass that Kasapa killed his father and then ascended the throne. However, the regicide knew that his deed would not go unpunished. He feared Mogalana's revenge and had a secluded fortress built that was beyond the reach of his half-brother, the rock city of Sagiria. In the new capital of the empire, Kasapa managed to remain in power for around 20 years before his fate finally caught up with him in 491. His half-brother, who had been exiled to South India, gathered a huge army around him and engaged his father's murderer in a final decisive battle. In the end, Magalana was victorious. The new king declared Anurapura the capital again and Siguria functioned as a Buddhist monastery until the 15th century. After the time of the monks, the king of Kandy was able to seek refuge in the fortress in the event of an emergency. In our western latitudes, however, we have only known of the existence of the legendary rock city since the late 19th century. At that time, British researchers were able to bring the ruins of Segoria back to archaeological reality with all the breathtaking contemporary evidence. Of Stone Lions and Revealing Images but why is the site known by the name Siguria of all names? Well, there's a very simple reason. This name is derived from Singha Giri, which means nothing other than Lion Rock, and alludes to the colossal guardian that every visitor once had to pass through. In detail, visitors had to pass through the mouth of a stone lion, which at the time was enthroned on a plateau on the northern side of the rock. Today, however, only the paws of the big cat remain, and yet its dimensions still bear witness to the awe-inspiring sight the Lion Gate must have once offered. Furthermore, the imposing gate also gives the idea that Sagiria was anything but a functional shelter that offered no amenities. In truth, 
The Lion City was not a desolate place whose everyday life was determined by the fear of omnipresent danger, but a thriving haven of life. Let's just take a look at the impressive Fountain Garden. It still bears witness to the extraordinary skills of its builders and is considered a prime example of ancient engineering. The ingenious system of wells, canals, lakes, and dams ensure that there was never a shortage of drinking water, even in the event of a prolonged siege. But that's not all. Some of these structures still function to this day, and they suggest that the builders of the time were generations ahead of their time. And even if some of Siguria's buildings have not managed to withstand the gnawing ravages of time, their remains provide a deep insight into the reality of life for the former inhabitants. Magnificent palaces greeted visitors high up on the rock, but today only the foundations remain. The reason for this is that the magnificent buildings were not made of solid stone, but of wood, which has weathered over time. Less weathered, but all the more wicked, is the case of the so-called Cloud Girls. These are detailed frescoes that line the ascent to the monolith, and are made up of bare-chested women. A contemporary inscription tells us that there were once 500 of these revealing works of art. Today, visitors can still marvel at 22 of them. However, the fact that they were damaged by unknown persons in 1967 shows that not everyone appreciates these irreplaceable testimonies to the times. In the 1970s, the Sri Lankan government then decided to restore some of the cloud girls and give them kind of a breast lift at the same time. In fact, some of the nipples were subsequently drawn slightly higher than originally. Incidentally, the 22 preserved frescoes have managed to survive all these centuries as they are located in a particularly protected spot. The corresponding rock niche is situated in such a way that it cannot be reached by the heavy rains. However, anyone visiting Singaria and thinking of taking photos of the works of art should be careful because it is strictly forbidden for tourists to photograph the cloud girls. As a rule, graffiti spraying is also strictly forbidden. However, the graffiti that adorns the so-called mirror wall of Sagaria is not a real nuisance for archaeologists, but an invaluable testimony to the times. It goes without saying that, that we are not dealing with any urban works of art here, but with the oldest known evidence of Sienalese poetry ever. Created between the 7th and 11th centuries, the deciphering of the mirror wall also played a decisive role in the research of the Sinhalese language. The content of the graffiti deals with the cloud girls, which is also how we know that 500 of the painted beauties once existed. But what does the name mirror wall actually mean? Did a huge mirror hang here hundreds of years ago in which the inhabitants could admire themselves? Well, it wasn't quite like that, but something like that. The name goes back to the fact that the plastered walls were always polished to a high gloss in the days of the king and thus allowed the ruler to admire his own face. The work of the gods? We have already told you about the background of the construction of Sigonaria, but the bottom line is that the local population has a completely different, far more spectacular version. The Lion City was by no means created by ordinary people, but by supernatural deities. But what is this exciting myth all about? Well, the divine creatures are said to have ascended to Earth from time to time, and in order to have a proper residence here too, they built the imposing complex on the top of the rock. In detail, Sigiria is said to have been modeled on the home of Kubera, who embodies the god of wealth, merchants, and treasures in mythology. And here's the thing, the Lion City is also said to have once had a magical palace that built a direct bridge between the world of the gods and our own. However, there are many alternative-minded spirits who immediately ring the pre-astronautical bells when they hear this story. In other words, the supposed gods were actually extraterrestrial intelligences, and the magical palace was nothing more than a kind of high-tech portal. But regardless of whether we believe in divine extraterrestrial origins or not, there is no question that Sigiria is still accompanied by some big question marks. Just as is the case with the Egyptian pyramids, the official history of the site is questioned mainly due to the immense effort that went into its construction. Some people even say that it would have been practically impossible for the people of the 5th century to haul the necessary materials to a height of 200 meters. And while the location is usually attributed to their practical all-around view and inaccessibility to the enemy, we must not forget that there was also a religious connection in this respect. 
For example, building on mountains or high cliffs often went hand in hand with the idea of being closer to the gods and being able to reach the kingdom of heaven more easily. However, only the former inhabitants of Sagaria could tell us what this exciting legend is really about. But unfortunately, they no longer have the opportunity to do so. The story of the ancient city of Mycenae's origins tells us that it was clearly not created by ordinary people. But how should we classify the legends about gods, heroes, and monstrous beasts from today's perspective? Could it be that all the adventurous legends ultimately have a kernel of truth? Or do we simply tend to hopelessly underestimate the abilities of our distant ancestors? On a small hill in Greece near the plains of Argos lies a stone testimony to time that opens the doors to days long past. With its fantastic myths of origins, the ancient city of Mycenae provides a deep insight into the beliefs of its time, and also shows the outstanding role played by Mycenaean in culture in the classical Greek era. However, the true origins of the Mycenae are unknown. All that is certain is that the once magnificent city was finally abandoned in the 3rd century BC. According to Greek mythology, however, the city's roots go back to Perseus, the son of Zeus and one of the most famous heroes of all. According to legend, the hero settled here to drink some water that had accumulated in a mushroom. With this in mind, it is not really surprising that the ancient Greek word mykes means nothing other than mushroom. Alternatively, Perseus's so-called ortpond fell to the ground here, which the ancient Greeks also called mykes, and which refers to the metal fitting on the tip of the sword scabbard. When Perseus Lee finally set off for the ancient city of Tyrans, he is said to have ordered some cyclops to build the walls of Mycenae with stones so heavy that no human could ever move them. The one-eyed monsters complied with the hero's request and gave the world a unique site that was to become one of the most prosperous centers of Greece in the course of time. The descendants of Perseus ruled here for three generations. The last in this heroic royal line was Eurytheus, who was succeeded by Atreus. His son, Agamemnon, led the Greeks in the legendary Trojan War, and in view of all these mythological figures, it is astonishing, to say the least, that the descriptions of Mycenae in the legends actually correspond to reality. And why the imposing walls are suspected of having been created by supernatural beings, as mentioned above, becomes clear when we take a closer look at their overwhelming dimensions and unusual elaboration. Appropriately, the technique is known as Cyclopean construction, and it is based on very large, irregularly shaped stones that are carefully stacked on top of each other. However, the fact that the walls of Mycenae not only required great care, but also unimaginable strength, is shown by the fact that some of their blocks weighed up to 120 tons. The Overwhelming Lion Gate of Mycenae when Mycenae was a strong military and economic power in the Bronze Age between 1400 and 1200 BC, new magnificent buildings were also constructed during this period of prosperity. First and foremost was the impressive Lion Gate. On the one hand, this formed the main entrance to the city, and on the other, it is no less than the oldest known monumental sculpture in Europe. In order to create the stone gate in the middle of the 13th century BC, its creators had to fit four massive monolith blocks together precisely, without the use of mortar, mind you. The so-called lintel, that is, the horizontal upper edge of the gate, ultimately gives the structure its illustrious name. Here, two detailed lions leap out at us, facing each other and enthroned on two sacrificial altars that form the base of a central pillar. And while this ancient relic, which forms an opening 3 meters high and 3 meters wide, has been largely preserved, an essential detail has been lost over time. As you can easily see, the heads of the cats of prey have been lost. It is suspected that they were made of bronze or the ceramic material stetite. But unfortunately, the excavations have so far failed to bring the lion skulls back to light. What has now been brought to light, however, is the mythical story of the awe-inspiring gate's origins. It goes without saying that it is not the work of an ordinary construction team, but goes back to the aforementioned King Atreus. In Greek mythology, however, he is not only known as an architecturally adept ruler, but also as a member of the dynasty that brought down the curse of the gods with its shameful deeds. 
However, it is unlikely that the archaeologist Kirikos Pitikos was also cursing when he rediscovered the Lion Gate of Mycenae in 1841. Once discovered, the irreplaceable testimony to time was then completely uncovered and rebuilt. However, while the Lion Gate had eluded the gaze of researchers for centuries, other structures presented themselves much less shyly. This applies in particular to the Treasure House of Atreus, which was conveniently never completely buried and could, therefore, never be forgotten. After the most magnificent of all the royal tombs preserved in Mycenae had already been visited by several researchers and relieved of one or two fragments, Heinrich Schleiman decided in 1874 to finally awaken the treasure house from its historical slumber. We now know that the domed tomb was built around 1250 BC and that it was the largest circular dome in the world for more than 1300 years. The name Treasure House probably goes back to the precious grave goods that were placed here with the deceased. However, as the valuables were completely stolen over time, we can only speculate today about the burial treasures that were once enthroned here. The Controversial Gold Mask of Agmanon Sometimes the treasure house of Atreus is also referred to as the Tomb of Agmanon. But the bottom line is that the mythological military leader has also immortalized himself in the archaeological legacy in other ways. Of course, it was no coincidence that Heinrich Schleiman was searching for the lost traces of the past in Mycenae. The German explorer, who had made a fortune in the California gold rush, dreamed of bringing the legendary city of Troy back to reality. Its existence had previously only been recorded in Homer's epics Iliad and Odyssey. Schleiman literally clung to the literary tales and was firmly convinced that they had a kernel of truth, and he was proved right. But although Schleiman is still celebrated as the discoverer of Troy, it was actually the Briton, Frank Calvert, who first identified the hill of Hisselark near the town of Brunabaski as the possible location of the lost site. As fate would have it, the two men crossed paths at the Dardanelles in August 1868 and Schleiman found out about Calvert's red-hot lead. However, as the Britons' funds were exhausted, he persuaded Schleiman to continue his excavations around the Hisselik. Schleiman gratefully accepted his colleague's information and promptly passed off the idea of digging there as his own. In 1871, Schleiman finally received the corresponding excavation license. However, the work was not initially a complete success. Despite all his efforts, it took another two years before Schleiman brought the first Trojan artifacts to light. In the end, however, the archaeologists decided to secretly smuggle the magnificent gold treasure of Priam out of the country, thus violating the agreement he had previously made with the government of the Ottoman Empire. A morally dubious step, but one that finally gave Schleiman the recognition in archaeological circles that he had longed for so long. In the period that followed, however, his urge to research was by no means limited to Troy. As already mentioned, it's also extended to Mycenae. Once again, Schleiman's motivations went back to the works of Homer, and once again, he recorded a discovery that had previously only existed in ancient myths and legends. In detail, this refers to the breathtaking gold mask which, according to Schleiman, depicts none other than the legendary King Agmanon. But that's not all. For while the artifact was discovered in a tomb near the Lion Gate, it also contained an unusually large skeleton, which Schleiman believed to be Agmanon himself. Between Legend and Reality So, was this the final proof that all the legends from Greek mythology were true? That there really were heroic legendary figures of divine descent back then, and that the walls of Mycenae really were built by Cyclops? Well, even in the more alternative camps, this has not been conclusively clarified. According to this, the supposed gods and monsters would in fact have been aliens and their spawn. As the people of antiquity simply could not have been able to create such magnificent sites, they were dependent on extraterrestrial help, according to the theory. But even apart from extraterrestrial intelligences, the interpretation of mythological traditions is anything but uncontroversial. Whether it's Plato's Atlantis story or the Trojan War, what was once considered a historical, factual account is now increasingly being labeled as purely fictional. As a result, discussions about the correct interpretations are still ongoing, 
But what is the situation in the case of Argmanon's skeleton? Well, according to our current state of knowledge, the tomb and its contents are dated to the middle of the 16th century BC. However, as researchers generally assume that the legends about the Trojan War, and therefore also about Agmedon, only emerged much later, the consensus has prevailed that the mask must have belonged to a Mycenaean prince of a previous dynasty. The year is 1985, when Japanese diving instructor Kihichiru Arataki ventures into the underwater world off the island of Yonaguni to open up new diving sites for tourists. But instead of exotic sea creatures and fascinating underwater plants, he saw something that has divided the research world into two camps ever since. A huge, strange-looking rock platform that was apparently man-made. Now, you might think that the discovery of a sunken archaeological site is quite spectacular, but not necessarily groundbreaking. However, this changes abruptly when we consider the following. The area in question has been underwater for a whopping 8,000 years. While the enigmatic structure is around 200 meters long and 150 meters wide, this raises a fundamental question. Who built it? Who was capable of mastering such a challenging project at a time when mankind was still in the infancy of civilization? Well, conservative researchers, who are notoriously reluctant to leave the confines of official historiography, answer this question as follows. It was Mother Nature. For although the so-called Unaguni Monument boasts astounding precision and astonishingly straight lines, it is said to merely be a natural erosion platform. On the other hand, there is the assumption that we are dealing with the stone traces of a completely unknown culture. An assumption that is held by a certain Graham Hancock. If you watch our videos regularly, you will know that the British alternative researcher is firmly convinced that a highly developed civilization lived on Earth long before our time. However, the ancient high-tech people were completely wiped out by a global flood disaster at the end of the last ice age. Well, at least almost because a few people are said to have managed to escape annihilation and spread their advanced knowledge to the rest of the world. In the rest of the long-established research world, however, this hypothesis is not really welcomed with open arms. It is generally dismissed as utter nonsense. No wonder the assumption that the Unaguni Monument was an artificial origin also stands in stark contrast to the current consensus. This states that, at the time, only simple hunter-gatherers lived in the southwest of Japan who simply could not afford a construction project of this magnitude. Despite all this, Hancock does not back down from his unconventional opinion, and he is not alone. Geologist Masaki Kimura from Ryoku University and Indian marine archaeologist Sri Sundaresh also have their problems with the erosion platform theory. After studying the ominous structure in detail, the experts pointed out, among other things, two megaliths with astonishingly straight lines and a trench with two 90-degree angles. In view of the fact that the Yanaguni Monument now lies around 25 meters below the surface of the water, Kamara estimates that the shadowy builder culture must have existed around 8,000 to 10,000 years ago, and it was by no means a loosely connected group, but a fully-fledged advanced civilization. Officially, however, the Sumerians are still regarded as the first people to reach this civilizational milestone. The creators of cuneiform writing and artificial irrigation lived in southern Mesopotamia in the 3rd millennium BC, 3,000 to 5,000 years after the supposed builders of the Unaguni Monument. Despite all the exciting alternative beliefs, we should not leave one thing unmentioned. There are also critical dissenting voices, even from the otherwise skeptical camp. Geologist Robert Schock, for example, is best known for his controversial redating of the Great Sphinx of Giza. In view of the conspicuous traces of water erosion, Schock came to the conclusion that the statue must actually be several millennia older than generally assumed. In the case of the Yonaguni Monument, however, the Boston University professor is of the opinion that we are dealing with a natural geological formation. Well, with one small caveat. It is conceivable that the locals have polished parts of the rock to make it appear artificial. This floating monolith is a huge mystery. From the mysterious underwater world back to the surface, in Hyogo Prefecture, near the town of Tagasago, sits a stone structure that is no less enigmatic than the Yonaguni Monument. 
In detail, it is a monolith almost 6 meters high and weighing an estimated 500 tons, which goes by the name of Isho no Hoden. However, there are a few factors that make this silent witness to history so much more than just an ordinary lump of rock. On the one hand, there are almost ridiculously straight edges, and on the other, it looks as if the massive load is floating above the surface of the water. However, this is not due to a mythical levitation technique, but to the column in the middle of the base, which appears invisible at first glance. Researchers generally assume that the megalith was never completed, but was left where it was carved. The Shintu Temple is located not far from the Colossus, and there is a simple reason for this. Ishi no Hoden has been revered as a shrine for centuries. But what is the background of this object? What do we know about its builders and its intended use? Well, the official version says that the rock was probably intended as a grave. This is a perfectly plausible assessment, but there is a small but crucial catch. There is simply no solid evidence for this. However, there is also no solid evidence for the theory that the precise side edges of the rock were carved with the tools we know. Such traces of working are only visible under the megalith, at the point where it is attached to a larger boulder. Geologists often explain the absence of such traces with erosion, but Ishi no Hoden was covered with rubble for a long time. With this in mind, one could be forgiven for thinking that the structure was not shaped using simple tools such as pickaxes and chisels. But how could it have been created? Well, the short and sweet answer is, we don't know. The only thing that is certain is that the rock and the surrounding rock were subjected to a series of modern laser measurements in 2005 and 2006. The experts came to the conclusion that Ishi no Hoden consists of hyloclastite, a special volcanic form of rock that was formed around 70 million years ago. Many an alternative mind quickly thinks of ancient lasers and other high technologies in light of this. But in this case too, the clear evidence has yet to emerge. The same also applies to the contemporary reports on the creation of the boulder, although Ishi no Hoden is already mentioned in the Harama Fudakai whose roots go back to the year 713 AD. The reason for its creation and the construction techniques used are not mentioned at all. Is the truth hidden in the fantastic legends? If Graham Hancock and company have their way, we would be well advised not to regulate the myths of our ancestors to the realm of fictional fairy tales, but rather to regard them as the result of a real memory. No wonder, after all, one of the British author's main arguments is based on the mysterious similarities and the legendary traditions of the various peoples. After all, practically every people knew the story of an all-destroying flood that brought forth higher beings with extraordinary knowledge. While, according to Hancock, these stories reveal the true background of the presumed precursor civilization, the question arises as to whether the mythological bridge can also be built to the Ishu no Hoden. So, let's take a closer look at the matter. Basically, the records from the Shinto shrine mentioned above tell us that the Kami Okunushi once ruled the land over Izumu in what is now Shimain Prefecture, a brief classification. In Shintoism, Kami are reversed spirits or gods. While the concrete translation of the term into German is quite tricky, it is clear that at the Shinto religion, there is an ancient connection between the Kami and severe waves of disease, droughts, and floods. Seen through the historical lens of Hancock, the question therefore arises as to whether the defined figures also emerged this time after a devastating catastrophe, and in reality embody the survivors of the predecessor culture. And we remember, the collectively forgotten people are said to have perished at the end of the last ice age. And lo and behold, some archaeological finds indicate that the belief in and worship of the Kami gods goes back deep into the Jomon period. The prehistory of Japan, which is divided into several phases, is dated to around 14,000 to 300 BC. No less exciting is the fact that the Kami Okunushi were known as the god of construction and was also admired for his secret knowledge and extraordinary healing skills. And isn't it amazing that we also find this wisdom symbolism in many other deities from completely different corners of the world? Just think of Krikrops from the Greek mythology. The hybrid of man and dragon is regarded as the founder of Athens, who introduced marriage, the first state institutions, and property rights. 
On the other side of the world, in Mesoamerica to be precise, the feathered serpent Quasotical took on a similar role in Mesopotamia. Oans was considered to be the first bringer of culture. However, it seems that not every gift of civilization was intended to be handed over in its entirety. The local Shinto myth, for example, reports that Okanushi was in the process of creating a magnificent monument, the foundation stone of which was Hisho no Hoden. However, after the first piece was completed, a bloody riot broke out, forcing the kami to turn away from his construction and ultimately leave it unfinished. There is no question that this mythological decoding offers a new and exciting clue, and yet, until this theory is backed up by solid archaeological evidence, it will remain pure speculation. At present, we only know that the mysterious boulder exists. When and how it was created is still unknown. However, it is well known when and how you can join our community. Namely, now and with a simple click on the subscribe button. So feel free to give us a thumbs up and subscribe so you never miss another exciting video from us.